Okay, so uh, let's move to uh, application number one of having these nice bipartite explicit expander graphs. So uh, let me just remind you again the uh, expander graph, the bipartite expander graph that we're going to assume we have for uh, the first application. And this first application will be in the theory of error correcting codes. So uh, once again, we're going to imagine we have, uh, we can deterministically construct in polynomial time an expander graph with uh, two sets of vertices. It'll be a bipartite expander graph. Um, on the left hand side, we'll have some n vertices. And on the right hand side, we'll have slightly fewer vertices. Uh, I'll call this set of vertices R. And here we had uh, 3 quarters n vertices. And let's also fix the degree to be the minimum amount that was allowed, which if you recall was 64. So we'll uh, assume that every vertex on the left has degree 64. And the vertices on the right, let me draw them here, um, we don't necessarily know anything about their degrees. Okay, so we're only assuming this is a left regular bipartite graph. And what is the condition on the, what is the expansion condition on this graph that we know? Uh, the condition is follows. Let's assume we have any subset of vertices over here, S. And S can be uh, any set of vertices as long as it's not too uh, big. It also cannot be the empty set. So let's assume that um, the cardinality of S is uh, not zero. And it's at most, well, some small fraction, let's say 0 0.2, uh, divided by the degree, which is fixed to be 64 times n. Okay, so for any subset of vertices like that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the vertices uh, that they're connected to on the right hand side. We'll call that the neighborhood of s, n of s. All the vertices on the right hand side connected to uh, vertex uh, s on the left hand side. And the expansion condition is that this neighborhood set is quite large always. So it's cardinality, well, the most it could possibly be is cardinality of s times 64, the degree times 64. Uh, and uh, what we're gonna, uh, the, the condition of the expansion condition we assume is that it's a good chunk of this, it's at least 80% of this, 0.8 times the degree 64 times cardinality of s. Okay, so uh, just to remind you, it's now uh, known through the art of deterministic construction of expander graphs, that we can deterministically efficiently construct uh, bipartite graphs that look like this. Maybe this 0.02 is a bit uh, smaller and maybe this 3 quarters is a bit smaller, but something like this. These parameters can definitely be achieved, uh, at least with a random graph. Okay, and now let's talk about application number one. So application number one of these kinds of graphs are a two good error correcting codes. So let me remind you briefly about error correcting codes. So um, we're going to be constructing uh, error correcting codes, which map some, um, they're going to be binary codes. So they'll be using uh, zeros and ones. They'll be map some um, string of length k to a string of length, a bigger string of length n. And uh, what we want is for it to be good. One thing we want is that n is not too much bigger than k. So ideally for quote unquote good codes, you want n to be just a constant factor bigger than k. So not too much redundancy. And the other uh, desideratum that we want for a uh, quote unquote good code is that it has a very good minimum distance. So any two code words should be far, uh, at least far apart as some absolute constant times n. So constant factor relative distance which means uh, so you can always correct the number of errors that's up to half the minimum distance. So um, this will mean if you have a good code that you can correct a constant fraction of errors in the n bit received word. And what we'll see is essentially as soon as you have these uh, expander graphs with these parameters, you immediately have a good error correcting code, which is um, quite hard to find in general. Furthermore, we'll actually see not just does it give you a good error correcting code, um, of course it's an explicit one, efficiently constructible, and we'll in fact have extremely efficient um, decoding algorithms. So that is another beautiful feature of these expander-based codes. Uh, okay, so before I get into saying exactly why uh, these bipartite expanders give you good codes, uh, let me just prove to you one small fact about uh, such bipartite graphs. 
I'll call this claim uh, one. So we're gonna have two claims in this little story. And it's the following. Suppose you have any set of vertices S, which has this uh, you know condition that it's not the empty set, and it's uh, at most you know 0 0.02 over 64n. Here I refer S should be a subset of the left vertices L. Um, then what I want to say is it has at least one uh, vertex V in its neighborhood set, which is a so-called unique neighbor. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean by that is just that it um, V, which is a vertex in R, has at most one uh, neighbor back in S. Okay, so let me draw you a little picture. Maybe here's S, maybe here's uh, some vertex V, and perhaps this is the unique neighbor for S, or a unique neighbor for S. Again, what does that mean? Well, V has some edges back to L, and the property of being a unique neighbor, we know it has at least one uh, edge to a vertex in S because V is a neighbor of the set S, but being a unique neighbor means it has exactly one. Okay, so let's prove this little claim. And the way we'll prove it is, um, well, let's assume for the sake of contradiction that every um, V in the neighborhood of S has at least two uh, neighbors back in S. Okay, so it has no unique neighbor. What we're gonna do is now um, count the number of edges touching S. So on one hand, since we have just decided that every vertex V in the neighborhood of S has at least two neighbors in S, uh, that means sort of each of these vertices V in neighborhood of S, you know, contributes or donates or, you know, is associated to two edges, two distinct edges which touch S. So by virtue of this assumption, we conclude, whoa, by virtue of this assumption, we conclude um, that um, uh, there are at least, well, so many edges touching S. And what is this uh, so many? Well, I just told you there's at least um, two for every vertex in the neighborhood of S. But by assumption over here, we know that this is at least two times 0.8 times the degree 64 times the cardinality of S. And uh, the key point here is that two times 0.8 is bigger than one, okay? Nothing more special than that. So this is, let's say, strictly greater than 64 times the cardinality of S. But um, this is indeed a contradiction. Why is it a contradiction? Well, I mean, uh, this bipartite graph has uh, is left regular with degree 64 on the left. So the maximum number of edges that could be touching S is 64 times cardinality of S. So that's a contradiction. And it completes the proof of this little claim. Okay, great, so let's put that claim in the bag. We'll need it for our analysis. And now I'm ready to tell you how to get an error correcting, a good error correcting code out of this bipartite expander graph. And the idea is really quite simple. I'm going to um, define the code. It's a binary code of uh, block length n by uh, specifying that it's parity check matrix H is basically the adjacency matrix of the graph. Well, not quite the adjacency matrix. I don't literally mean view the graph as a full graph in the adjacency matrix. I kind of mean the bipartite adjacency matrix. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. So what I'm saying here is um, this parity check matrix for the code H, it's going to be in um, F2 to the R cross L. It's a little bit backwards, but R cross L. So this parity check matrix H will look like this. It'll be indexed by the rows, sorry, it'll be indexed by the right hand vertex set R, and uh, the columns will be indexed by the left hand vertex set L. 
Remember, this is 3 quarters n vertices, and this is n vertices. Okay, uh, here's the picture back up here. So the rows will be indexed by the right-hand vertex side. The columns will be indexed by the left-hand vertex side. And uh, right, so we'll just put, it'll be a 0, 1 matrix, and we'll put a, a, a 1 in an entry if there's an edge from that vertex on the left to that vertex on the right. So in particular, if you think about it, um, for every column, because it's uh, regular on the left, for every column, uh, we'll have you know, 64 ones in here in each column. Okay, and uh, what does it mean for this to be the parity check matrix? Well, I'll remind you once in coding theory terms, and then I'll also sort of give you um, like a picture involving the graph. So what does it mean for uh, a matrix to be a parity check matrix? It means that uh, if we look at any received word, Z, okay, so let me call this uh, Z. This is uh, in F2 to the N. Um, Z is a code word if and only if HZ equals zero. Okay, that's the definition of the parity check matrix. Hz is the zero vector of three quarters n uh, height. Okay, so zero is a, z is a zero one vector, and these h's rows are zero one vectors as well. And um, each of them you kind of dot product against uh, z, and to be a code word, all these dot products should be zero. Now let me think. Uh, I explain it to you uh, with the picture. If you think about that, what does it mean? Let me try to get rid of this orange stuff here. Uh, what it means is, um, you see, given a received word z in f2 to the n, you can think of it as um, being, you know, its indices as being labeled, sorry, its indices as being associated with the vertices of L, and therefore you can think of the code words uh, bits as like labeling the vertices of L. So z1, z2, up to zn. Given a code word, these are like 0, 1 entries uh, labeling the vertices. And now, um, a, uh, each um, row of the parity check matrix, each parity check is associated with the vertex on the right-hand side. And we don't know anything about its degree, remember, but I mean, it has uh, edges to some vertices back in L. And uh, it's a parity check in the sense that um, the constraint is that the parity or XOR of these bits should be zero. That's exactly what's going on with this uh, matrix scenario. So to say that um, for every row, let's say that HZ is zero, is to say that for every row of H, if you dot it with Z, mod two, you get just the, the number zero. Well, mod two, that's exactly saying that um, for every vertex on the right here, if you look at its neighbors back in S and um, just add up mod two, the labels that z gives to them, those should add up to zero. Okay, so you're a code word z if uh, when you, you know, put your uh, bits onto the vertices of L, they satisfy all the sort of parity checks or XOR checks implied by the right-hand side vertices. Great, so that's uh, the definition of the code. And uh, it's a linear code, it's a linear subspace. Uh, so what are the two things we always want to know about a code? We want to know about its rate and we want to know about its minimum distance. So its rate is easy to work out uh, or its uh, dimension is um, equivalently. So uh, the dimension or the quote unquote K for the code. Well, um, if you recall for linear codes, it's just going to be N minus the number of parity checks, three quarters N. Okay, and that's kind of easy to see because each parity check is like a linear constraint on Z. And so every time you insist on a parity check, it kind of knocks out one dimension. And we have three quarters N parity checks, so uh, the Zs that satisfy all these parity checks um, will form a subspace of dimension one quarter N. Okay, and this is the thing that's usually called K. And this is great, this is wonderful because it means the rate, which is K over N, is a quarter. And that's wonderful. That's a nice big number. Um, it means n is just 4k. So if you want to encode a message of k bits, you only use 4 times k bits um, to encode it. So that's great. Just a blow up of size 4. 
Okay, so it's got a good rate. That's one of the criteria we need for a, a, a so-called good code. And the other thing we need is a good minimum distance, okay, which uh, means all the code words are far apart in Hamming distance. And um, one thing you may recall about a linear code is that um, there's a nice characterization of its minimum distance. It's also the minimum Hamming weight of any non-zero code word. So in a linear code, um, the all zero string is always a code word. It always passes all the parity checks, of course. Um, so what you want to do is you want to look at uh, the non-zero code word that has the lowest Hamming weight. And its Hamming weight is the minimum distance of the code. Okay, it's at that distance from the zero code word, but also it's not hard to see that like every pair of code words has to be at least this uh, Hamming weight apart. So my claim is that the minimum distance of this code is actually greater than this quantity 0.02 over 64n, this uh, upper bound and the allowable set size s that you can apply the expansion guarantee to. And uh, if I prove this claim, that's also super great because this is indeed a constant fraction of n. It means you can correct up to half this uh, number of errors in your error correcting codes. So you can correct 0.01 over 64n many uh, errors. And that's a constant fraction of n, so that's uh, that's that's great. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so uh, to prove this claim, it's going to be easy. I'm going to use uh, the other claim, claim one, as I called it. I suppose this is claim two, but anyway. Um, okay, so as I said, the minimum distance in this linear code is the the minimum weight of a non-zero code word. So let me just lazily do this by contradiction again. So let's assume, for the sake of contradiction, that uh, z is a n bit vector, which is not the zero vector, and it's a code word, and its uh, Hamming weight is at most this 0.02 over 64n. Okay, and now, of course, you may have guessed this, we can think of z is the indicator, as the indicator, the zero one indicator of a subset s of the left vertex set. Remember when we have a received word z, we can always sort of uh, label the vertices of the left set by the bits of z. And you know, all the bits labeled one, or we think of as the subset s. Uh, okay. And now you maybe not be surprised uh, as to what we do next, we apply claim one. And claim one tells us therefore, that this set uh, S, okay, it's not the uh, empty set because Z is not the zero code word, but it does have a uh, size at most this key bound. The claim one tells us that this set S has a unique neighbor, one of these unique neighbors in uh, R, call it V. Not really sure we need to call it anything because let me just show you the, what happens in the picture now. If we go back up here, let's imagine this uh, orange square here was V, this unique neighbor. Oh, it can't be because this, this neighbor has uh, two vertices, two neighbors back in S. So let me erase this one. Okay, so now, um, yeah, now this V uh, could be a unique neighbor. Oops. Yeah, well, it is in the neighborhood of S according to this picture. Let me extend the neighborhood of S here, hypothetically. Okay, so this vertex V is uh, a neighbor of Hmm, gosh, I guess it's not. Let me extend S as well. Great, I think I've finally drawn the diagram nicely. So here's S and this uh, vertex V here is a unique neighbor in the sense that it's a neighbor of S, but it's, um, it has no other edges that uh, go into S. And now let's just think about the parity check associated to this vertex V. Well, um, this parity check is just, you know, XORs together all the labels, uh, um, of z that z gives the vertices which are neighbors of v so uh, you know this one and this one and this one and this one but remember i mean the set s is all those positions or all those vertices where z has the coordinate one so it means that you know the label here is zero and then this one is zero and this one is zero and all the the edges that go to something not in s get zero but you know the single unique edge that goes back to s gets one so the xor is one which means the parity check did not pass. So that proves it's not a code word. That's the contradiction. 
Or if you want to think about it uh, this way, I'm not sure if this will help that much, but um, if this is the row associated to V, um, and uh, these sort of dots, let me say these yellow columns are the ones where uh, Z has a one, which is equivalent to the set S. Then what we just showed here was that, um, you know, there's a unique one here, there'll be zero in all these other S rows, and there could be zeros or ones elsewhere, but it doesn't matter, uh, because when you dot product this row with Z, you just pick up uh, these products, or these uh, bits, so you get exactly one. Okay, I suppose the picture was clearer. Um, okay, so it has a unique neighbor in uh, R, call it V, and then by our picture argument, um, it implies that the parity check associated to V does not pass, contradicting Z being a code word. Okay. So, uh, great, that's it. Uh, so this uh, shows that once you have this expander graph, this bipartite expander graph, you automatically get a good code for it. And uh, you can deterministically efficiently construct it given n, so that's great. And it's always nice to have a linear code that you can efficiently construct because then encoding is very easy. Well, you have to actually work out the generator matrix for that. I wrote a little Piazza post about how you go from the parity check matrix to the generator matrix, but basically it's, you take out a few, uh, um, columns and then take the transpose. Um, and it's very nice to have, uh, you know, linear code, a generator matrix, because then encoding is easy. You just, uh, it's just a matrix vector multiply. And what about decoding? So actually that turns out to be another beautiful, um, uh, aspect of these expander based codes. Um, all of the things I'm saying, by the way, I forgot to mention it, but they originate in, uh, well, papers by Tanner and also Spielman and, uh, Sipser and Spielman from 96. And uh, one thing they proved, which I will not prove to you here, maybe it'll be in homework, um, but it's quite easy, is that uh, this code has polynomial time, uh, poly n time decoding from uh, up to you know, half the uh, minimum distance. So from less than D over two errors, where I've written capital D for the minimum distance. Normally you write little d, but we use that for degree in, in graph. So uh, yeah, this algorithm or this code has an efficient um, decoding algorithm that takes any received word, which has fewer than minimum distance over two errors and finds the nearest code word. Uh, just a couple of comments on this. Uh, first of all, uh, this very simple algorithm crucially uses, I mentioned this before, but it really uses that 0.8 is greater than three quarters. Okay, so this 0.8, which was sort of the amount of expansion that we got in our uh, neighbor set sizes, was quite good expansion and we rely on the fact that it's bigger than three quarters to get this uh, fact about decoding. Um, another great fact is that if you're actually very careful, you can take this poly n time and make it linear time. Okay, so that requires uh, more work than this uh, argument that is easy and perhaps will be on homework. Um, that one's not as easy, but that's a beauty of it that this is a, uh, not only is it a good code, but it has a super fast linear time decoding algorithm, which is also wonderful. And let me tell you one more wonderful thing. I'll just tell you, uh, not the super fast algorithm, but a polynomial time decoding algorithm. It's so easy. I will write it for you here in two lines. Here's a decoding algorithm. That's polynomial time. Uh, here it is. You're given Z received word. And let's assume it um, differs from a code word in at most D over two places, and we want to find that code word. So here's the algorithm. Um, it's a while loop, while H times Z um, does not have Hamming weight zero, 
flip any bit of uh, z that causes this Hamming weight to decrease. Okay. So, um, you know, if you get down to the case where h times z has Hamming weight zero, it means it's the zero vector, which means it's a code word. And if you're not at a code word, then just go through all the bits of n and try flipping them and see if that decreases, you know, the number of failing parity checks. If it makes more parity checks accept. And if flipping a bit causes uh, a parity check, uh, well, more parity checks to accept than it causes to break. So it makes the overall number of successful parity checks go up. Then just do that flip. That's it. That's the whole algorithm. Um, and the analysis that it, um, in polynomial time, uh, gets to a code word uh, within distance d over 2 is not that hard. It's like a page long. Maybe even that could be homework. Who could say? Uh, this is an example of a simple belief propagation style algorithm. And yeah, the fact of it, that it works, again, relies on the expansion properties of the bipartite graph.